Ian's questions to the Finance Minister, and we will now move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And again, we will start with topical questions. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister, um, would she agree with me that last Friday's Northern Ireland Investment Conference was the best showcase event and was superbly organised by Invest Northern Ireland? This could be a very short uh, answer, uh, Mr. Principal, the Deputy Speaker. Um, this is a pretty tough question, uh, and uh, I'm sure that it will be followed up by an equally tough question from Mr. Alistair later on. Um, but can I say that I was extremely proud of the way in which the investment conference was planned, uh, executed, and uh, I was very proud of the fact that we had 121 uh, international companies uh, at the investment conference with 55 potential uh, new investors. And instead of the selling being carried out by ministers and by Invest Northern Ireland, but of course we were doing that uh, in any event, the, the main uh, piece of the conference was really hearing from the investors who are already in Northern Ireland and who felt so strongly about their investment and about the experience they've had here in Northern Ireland that they wanted to advocate on behalf of Northern Ireland as a place to do business. So I think it was a tremendous success. We look forward to the tangible benefits of the investment conference rolling out over the next six to 18 months. Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Minister, for that uh, very responsive answer. Um, could I ask the Minister, um, you mentioned about six to nine months, would you have any idea um, what sort of investment will come, come back at this stage? Are there any indications that people are genuinely interested in investing in Northern Ireland? Well, yes, I believe that the investment conference was a great catalyst for uh, moving potential investors uh, along that decision making route. Um, there were some people at the conference uh, who were visiting Northern Ireland for the very first time. Uh, there were some people who had already made visits here and were actually close to making uh, a decision. Uh, and because of that, uh, there will be, uh, I think, investment decisions made very soon in relation to Northern Ireland as a place to do business. There will be others who will follow through maybe at a later stage. But I would think within the next six months we will see uh, a tangible benefit. And that is a change, if I may say so, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, from the last investment conference which I attended uh, then as the Environment Minister back in May of 2008, he held here in Northern Ireland. And at that stage we were saying that to look forward we would uh, need to assess what was happening in 18 months' time. But I think the fact that we had potential investors, some of them further along the road than others there, I think we will see tangible benefits in the next six months. Mr. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I'll be very careful not to uh, go into the area of, of the oral questions. Minister, rural broadband and the issues of the last sort of 10 per cent in Northern Ireland that has not yet been covered by broadband. Can the Minister give the House an update on where the Department stands with the BDUK rollout and for the uninitiated that is broadband development uh, fund that the Government announced in September of last year? And uh, can I say to the member, he uh, probably could get a more detailed answer to this because uh, question number four, which I think he's probably referring to, Mr. Principal <laughs> Deputy Speaker, has been withdrawn uh, by Mr. McRae, and therefore I can go into some more detail uh, for uh, the member. Um, we are uh, moving ahead with the BDUK money. Uh, we have been carrying out consultations in relation to what we need to do in Northern Ireland. That has been somewhat held back uh, by the European Union in relation to state aid rules. Uh, and because of that, we had to carry out a, a further consultation. Uh, we have received responses to that further consultation, some 156 uh, individuals and 13 organisations, highlighting uh, nearly 700 postcodes uh, where it was felt broadband was not available. So we're taking all those into uh, consideration and we hope to move forward on this matter very soon. Craig, for his supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, with regard to the rollout, um, it will not really matter who wins the project in my mind as long as they actually deliver, as I will admit to being one of these people without broadband. Well, areas where there is a large concentration of housing, such as my own, where there's over 150 houses affected by this, be given prioritisation under whoever wins the scheme. 
And will the Minister also give a commitment that it will not undermine any of the previous schemes that uh, her department has ruled out in rural areas? As a member will know, uh, what we very much want to avoid doing is to have any duplication at all. So to his latter question, uh, this is very much to add value to uh, what is already in place and uh, to to reach those harder areas um, to get to, particularly in rural areas. Although I do take his point that there are some areas which he may not consider rural in the Northern Ireland sense, uh, which are still suffering um, from not having access to broadband. He will be pleased to know that the uh, Anna Hilt postcodes, uh, which I know he has been raising with me uh, on a number of occasions, as indeed of his colleagues uh, will be included in the intervention area and uh, we will move forward and uh, as he says he doesn't mind who gets the uh, procurement or who wins the tender uh, as long as it's delivered and that's certainly the position of the department as well. And I call Ms Lawrence Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, be aware of uh, the work, uh, I think fairly piece of substantial work going on by Invest NI in relation to how they can set more challenging targets, moving from jobs promoted to jobs created. I wonder, could you uh, give us any further information in relation to that work and when it might be completed? Well, indeed, and this has been uh, an issue that has come before this House on many occasions, so much so that when uh, we launched the Jobs Fund, which is the fund that was set up to try and bring about jobs quickly with some of our more indigenous firms, that it uh, immediately had that jobs created, um, if you like, target there. Uh, it has been a transition a piece in, in respect of uh, other selective financial assistance and as I said previously I hope that those will come forward in the very near future. In relation to the targets that have been set for Invest Northern Ireland, um, in terms of the job funds uh, the target is to create, to actually create 4,000 jobs through the jobs fund um, and that's on the 2011-15 target and we're already at 3,306 in terms of the jobs yeah, fund. Yeah. So I think we will see uh, the jobs fund going way beyond its target. I have certainly said to the Chief Executive and to Invest Northern Ireland that I expect them to go way beyond their target uh, because I really do believe that the jobs fund, in very small ways sometimes, is making an absolutely fundamental difference to the uh, jobs available right across Northern Ireland. Mrs Dolores Kelly for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, will those definitions then have a read across, in particular to EU funding, and, and indeed be adopted uh, by DARD in terms of their assessment of projects for uh, rural development funding? I can't speak for the Agriculture Minister, and I know there's a consultation uh, going on in, at the moment in respect of the Rural Development Programme. Uh, I very much hope that job creation will be one of the elements that she will look at in her Rural Development uh, Programme, because I think it would really add value to the rural uh, setting in Northern Ireland if we could look at jobs created as well. Uh, I have asked, for example, Intertrade Ireland um, uh, on a north-south basis to look at jobs created when they are, are looking at what they're doing in their programmes. And of course, Intertrade Ireland is not a job creation agency, it's a trade agency, but yet I have asked them to look at how many jobs they're creating when they intervene as well. So I think it's a very good mechanism to have there. Sometimes it's not the primary uh, reason where we intervene, but I think it's good to know the number of jobs that have been created. Well, Ms. Katrina Ruyan. At the previous last thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'd just like to ask the Minister, given that in her recent correspondence to my colleague Chris Hazard, um, she acknowledged that the Tourist Board recognised Explorers Aquarium um, as a major, major tourist attraction. And I wonder um, what, and also given that the Minister spoke about the need to, for Ards Borough Council to uh, continue to support this project or to find a sustainable solution, I wonder could the Minister outline what engagements she's had with the Minister for Environment or indeed Ards Council personal involvement herself uh, to lend their department's assistance to ensure this project continues? Thank the member for her question, and indeed I did say that uh, in my answer to her colleague uh, in relation to Explorers. And uh, 
Therefore, I, I'm sure she'll be a little surprised to know that I haven't had any correspondence from ARDS uh, Council in relation to this issue. Uh, I do believe, uh, I, I mightn't have said major, major, uh, but I do believe that uh, Explorers does provide a tourism offering, uh, particularly in Port of Ferry, because Port of Ferry uh, is quite remote. It's not a, as easy to access, perhaps, as some other areas, and it will have a huge impact on it. But I think the solution uh, in relation to this is to look uh, to all sources of funding, uh, whether that's public funding or private funding, and uh, I understand uh, my ministerial colleague, the Minister of Environment, is bringing uh, an executive paper, uh, which unfortunately I haven't had sight of as yet, but we wait to see the content of his executive paper. For supplementary. Well, Gawain Buick was the narrow than Fragger Shin. I want to thank the Minister for that answer. I am a bit surprised that there weren't more meetings, but anyway, there's still time for that to happen. Um, but I suppose the question I have is, what, does the Minister believe that if this project is such an important project, and I believe it is, that over the last 26 years, uh, 1.8 million of support was only provided by uh, NITB? Now, that seems a very, very small amount of money over a period of 26 years, and I would ask the Minister if she will redouble her efforts to continue to find a solution that is, her department is part of. I am, of course, happy to work with other executive colleagues to be a part of the solution. I don't accept uh, what she says in relation to the £1.8 million. I think there are a lot of facilities right across Northern Ireland who would be very content to have £1.8 million of Northern Ireland Tourist Board funding. Uh, in fact, I can think of a few off the top of my head uh, in my own constituency who would be quite happy to have that sort of funding. But I will work with uh, uh, ministerial colleagues. I look forward to receipt of the executive paper. Uh, um, but I do make the point to the member that I think it's about looking at a holistic uh, answer to this problem. It is a problem. We have to look everywhere to find solutions and it's not just a question, and I'm sure she's not suggesting this, it's not just a question of coming to central government with the handout. I don't think that's what they're doing in Explorers. I've had some very interesting conversations about alternative answers to what's happening in Explorers and I look forward to continuing those discussions. To Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister what she's doing to further promote St. Patrick's Centre and the St. Patrick's Trail? I thank the Member uh, for that question, and I know the Member, and indeed the Member of Parliament for the area, raises this question with me quite frequently. We have uh, a designated officer in the Tourist Board to work with uh, the St. Patrick's Trail and promote it. I happen to think that we could do more to promote St. Patrick's Trail because I think it's a tremendous asset that we have. Yeah. It's one of those assets that uh, I don't believe people are aware of and that, I have to say, comes back to the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and Tourism Ireland to promote uh, the St. Patrick's uh, for example, if you have people coming across in their own cars, uh, I think that there's a great opportunity for people to travel from Armagh right the way around to Downpatrick uh, and indeed further uh, to see the birthplace and to really celebrate uh, the Christian heritage that we have here in Northern Ireland. So I'm very content to say to the member that we will work with him and indeed his other colleagues uh, in the two constituencies, at least, I say at least, uh, concerned because I know that North Down uh, as well have a very keen interest in St. Patrick as well. Didn't forget you, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Rogers for supplementary. Thanks, Minister, for your response. And, and I suppose just following on from that, um, will there be more funds available, particularly for the marketing of the product? Of course we will um, continue to work with the St. Patrick's Trail. Um, I always, when I look at marketing um, uh, right across Northern Ireland and where we're using it uh, internationally, look to see that it has a geographical spread. And I think that's important because uh, tourism is a product that goes right across Northern Ireland and therefore that should be reflected in all of our marketing produce. I'm content that that is the case, but as I said, we're happy to work with colleagues uh, in all of the constituencies concerned to make sure that that is the case going forward. Mr. Sidney Anderson. For Thank you, Principal Minister. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for her views on the possible investment impact of uh, Chancellor George Osborne's announcement uh, that visa applications for Chinese visitors to the United Kingdom are to be relaxed? Well, we very much welcome uh, this announcement in Northern Ireland, um, particularly from a tourism standpoint. 
Uh, we believe that this will increase the number of tourists that will come uh, to the wider UK but also to Northern Ireland and we are building up a very firm relationship with our colleagues in China and uh, the, uh, this arrangement which the Chancellor announced yesterday I think is going to be a very positive one for Northern Ireland and we'll certainly be using it to our advantage from a tourism perspective but also from a business perspective. It's the time up for topical questions. I'm sorry we haven't a chance for the supplementary. And we'll move on now to those questions that are listed for uh, oral uh, questions to the Minister. And I call Ms Katrina Ruan. Oh, sorry, that question has been withdrawn. And let me just bring the, the members up to date. Questions 1, 4, 8 and 9 have been withdrawn. Question in, the, in the instance of question 1, it has been transferred to DFP for, for a written response. So I call Mr Chris Little. Question number two. I travelled to Milan last week to attend the official media launch of the 2014 Giro d'Italia, where I had the opportunity to meet with many sporting journalists as well as those from the travel and trade media. There is enormous prestige for Northern Ireland in being selected as the start venue for this event, and our promotion of the event is already underway. During the 2013 <coughs> event, Tourism Ireland put in place a busy programme of promotions to capitalise on the tourism potential for Northern Ireland, with a presence throughout the entire race, distributing brochures and information about holidaying in Northern Ireland. They also hosted a press briefing at the end of the Giro 2013 for 100 key sports and lifestyle journalists from Italy and elsewhere around the globe. Promotion will continue up to and during the event through Tourism Ireland and the Northern Ireland Tours Board promotional campaign. Well, for a supplementary. Thank the uh, Minister for her answer and I uh, share her delight in the announcement of the routes for the Giro Italia. I'm delighted that it will be passing through my own constituency of East Belfast and I've, I've cycled the, the route and it's going to take in some amazing locations. So congratulations to the department on the work that they've done to secure uh, the Italia for this route. Can I ask the Minister how she intends to engage with local SMEs and cycling companies to ensure that they can maximise their involvement and benefit from this truly international event? And that's a, a very good question because uh, one of the things that we developed uh, before the G8 conference was the fact that we wanted uh, the Tourist Board and Invest Northern Ireland to work in a more holistic way and that was actually the first time that they had joint uh, campaigns and joint marketing and I would very much hope that that will be the case uh, for the Giro d'Italia as well. I did have uh, a meeting with the British Consul General in Milan when I was out. He is very keen uh, to make sure that we bring some Northern Ireland firms out to Milan uh, and likewise I would very much like to bring some Italian firms here as well. Obviously we have some very good uh, cycling uh, SMEs and not so SMEs as well as he will know. Uh, some of our firms are, are globally recognised actually in this field so I think there's a great opportunity not just from a tourism perspective which I celebrate but also from a business perspective as well. Mr Mervyn Storey. Thank you Mr Speaker and can I also concur with the words of congratulations and, and well done to the Minister for all the work that has been done in relation to this issue and welcome the fact that uh, this event will pass through Ballymoney and places like Ballyboogie which will put them on the map in terms of, of the world stage. Can the Minister explain or maybe expand as to what work her department along with the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and local councils will have in regards to the promotion of these events so that as we had with the, the Olympic torch we maximise every possible organisation to ensure that Northern Ireland and particularly my Northampton constituency is highlighted in the best possible light. Well, we will be working in partnership again, just as we did with the uh, G8. The fact that we worked so closely with Fermanagh District Council during that event, I think, is a very good template. Can I also say to him that the Irish Open was a very good template in working with councils and with other government departments? And so, this is something that we will continue to do. Uh, I'm sure that the Italians, in particular, are looking forward to Ballybogie uh, in your <laughs> constituency. Uh, but what we're looking forward to uh, is actually selling. Northern Ireland to the world stage. When I uh, visited Milan and was a part of the um, announcement uh, last week, uh, the excitement from all of the journalists in relation to the fact that it was coming to Northern Ireland, I think, was something that I was very proud of. So we look forward to the event. We look forward to uh, the build-up to the event uh, with all of the different councils and with all of the different agencies, and I'm sure that we'll be able to maximise the, the fact that we're having this huge event coming to Northern Ireland. 
So Sean Rogers. Minister for our answers thus far and obviously disappointed it hasn't come to the moors but to invite her or our officials to come on the 27th of October when it's the moor and ETAP. But my question Minister really is, have you any plans to try and uh, encourage other grand tours like the Tour of Spain and the Tour of France to come to this part of the world? Well, in actual fact, um, the Tour de France is going to Yorkshire next year, um, but we're first, we're in May, uh, so I take great delight in that. But I do hope that uh, when we make, and I say when we make this the success that it's going to be, that we will then attract other major events, and I make no secret of the fact that I hope the Tour de France does come uh, to Northern Ireland in the near future when they see how well we're able to host the Giro d'Italia. As a member will know, uh, and I, I have answered his previous topical question in relation to the Mountains of Mourne, a place I love very well, I had no input into the, the choice of route. Uh, I think that's something that some people got a little bit excited about, uh, but they shouldn't have because the route was picked uh, by the professionals, by the people who were planning the route. They had very stringent uh, reasons for why they picked different routes, particularly in, in relation to time trials and what have you, uh, and therefore we had no uh, impact at all in relation to where the route should go, and I just wanted to put that on the record to you today, because uh, otherwise it would have been coming to County Fermanagh, let's be honest. I call Miss Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, the Giro d'Italia is a hugely significant event for Northern Ireland, and I commend the Minister and her executive colleagues for for bringing it to Northern Ireland. And uh, I could mention uh, our own Minister Danny Kennedy for his part in that as well. I, I thank the Minister for responses to the questions so far. Um, I uh, I do hope that SMEs from my own constituency of Mid Ulster um, continue to be involved in the event as they were in, in the original launch. But can the Minister maybe confirm to the House um, that the news of the suspension of the race director uh, following alleged financial irregularities will not affect the, the hosting of the event in Northern Ireland this year? Well, actually, uh, and I welcome her comments in relation to the DRD Minister, because when I say I'm working with councils and other government agencies, I do mean, of course, road service as well, which uh, will have a key role to play uh, in relation to this issue, just as they did in relation to the Irish Open. But, of course, they'll have more of a role in this event, because, of course, it will take place on our public roads, and uh, we need the cooperation of road service in relation to that issue. Uh, in relation to the suspension of the CEO, uh, it's the CEO of the entire uh, RC organisation uh, of which the GEAR was only uh, a part uh, and of course when I heard the news, I think it was the Thursday before the launch, I immediately uh, made contact with RCS and spoke to the interim uh, CEO and he assured me that the Giro is over 100 years old, that it had absolutely no impact, uh, the suspension in relation to another sporting event had no impact in relation to the Giro d'Italia and that it will proceed without any uh, issue at all. Of course, I was concerned because uh, public money has been invested uh, into the Giro d'Italia and I wanted to make sure that our funding uh, was secure and I can give uh, the member the assurance that our money is secure. Call Mr. Framakan. Question three. I recently received a copy of NICVA's report and will be meeting with their representatives to discuss this and other recent NICVA research reports related to the economy on the 5th of November. As outlined in Building a Prosperous and United Community, the UK Government has committed to make a final decision on the devolution of corporation tax to Northern Ireland no later than the autumn statement in 2014. Work is ongoing uh, between the Executive and the UK Government to examine the potential to devolve specific additional fiscal powers. Recommendations for further devolution will be put to the Executive and Government Ministers by autumn of 2014. McCann for supplementary. The, the Minister has just asked, uh, answered the this, this supplementary that I was going to ask. Related to that, um, has the Minister or her department done any assessment <coughs> excuse me, into the report presented by uh, NICFA, or prepared by NICFA on the implications of welfare reform, which said that it had the potential to withdraw £750 million worth of expenditure from the local economy? Uh, to ask the Minister if she has done any assessment of that aspect of the report, please. Thank the, the Chair for his question. As I indicated to, to the previous member, I will be meeting Nick for not just on the uh, fiscal powers report, but also on their other recent reports as well. So I look forward to that engagement with Nick at that time on the 5th of November. 
Mr. Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Can the Minister give us a further update on the devolving of corporation tax and perhaps the time scale in relation to it? Well, as members will know, the Executive is continuing to press uh, for the power to set a lower rate of corporation tax in Northern Ireland, and indeed the Prime Minister, when he was here uh, last Friday, made reference to corporation tax from the stage of the Titanic Centre. Uh, we believe the case is very strong, and the merits of the case have been set out in a range of research uh, already in the public domain. Uh, I, of course, uh, remain disappointed that the Prime Minister has delayed his decision until autumn next year, but there it is. It is delayed until autumn of next year after the Scottish referendum. Uh, but we remained uh, committed to working uh, with particularly Treasury officials on the run-up uh, to that decision because, of course, there's a lot of work that needs to be carried out uh, before any decision uh, comes forward in autumn of next year. I call Mr Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. I may ask the Minister if she would expand on the specific fiscal powers that we're talking about. What other details are there within that? Well, uh, Nick Foote talks about uh, a range of fiscal powers. For our part, um, the Treasury and the Economic Pact paper uh, said that they were going to explore other tax options that would aid us in, in our long-term goal uh, of rebalancing the Northern Ireland economy, uh, such things as uh, R&D tax credits, enhanced annual investment allowance, training credits, uh, and national insurance holidays as well. So those are, are four. However, uh, of course, we should sound a note of caution and say that those options um, of course, will uh, have their associated difficulties, uh, not least state aid issues, uh, it has to be said, and of course, uh, they will have to be paid for as well. But those are the sort of things that uh, are being looked at uh, by Her Majesty's Treasury in relation to the Economic Pact paper. And I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Hey, question number five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Deti grants petroleum licences for the exploration, appraisal and production of oil and gas. My department does not grant licensing uh, for hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing is a specialised engineering process associated with some types of drilling operations which require permission from a number of authorities, including my department. As yet, no applications have been received for drilling or hydraulic fracturing in Fermanagh. And I call Tom Elliott for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. I wonder could the Minister give us a brief outline of the process that's required to uh, grant the licence for hydraulic fracturing or indeed the process that she has just outlined, and if the, the landowner's consent is required for the use of the land or can it be vested? Well, I thank the member uh, for his question. In relation to the land issue, because I understand Greenpeace had a statement out uh, yesterday in relation to landowners and, and their legal powers. For us in Northern Ireland, holders of petroleum licences, um, and if he's talking about Fermanagh, that would be Timborne, uh, need to obtain the permission of the landowners beneath whose land they wish to drill. Um, and the landowner's permission uh, is asked for. Uh, if it is granted, um, then that can take place. Um, and uh, therefore it is required uh, before drilling for deep geothermal energy, energy storage, carbon storage projects and hydraulic fracturing. Uh, of course with hydraulic fracturing, uh, because of the way in which it takes place, it's not just straight down, of course it goes out uh, further, uh, but they will still need uh, the permission of Northern Ireland uh, landowners before that can take place. At present, as I understand it uh, from the company in County Fermanagh, they uh, expect to apply uh, to drill a deep a borehole to retrieve rock core from the Bundoran Shale for analysis. They haven't applied uh, to the department to drill that hole as yet. Um, what they want to do is take out uh, some of the shale to have a look at it, but as yet that application has not, took pl not, had not taken place, uh, so therefore uh, that's where the situation is at present. I call Mr George Robinson for supplementary. Mr. Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister, uh, shale gas in all regions of the world is bringing down energy costs to businesses. Does this threaten businesses in Northern Ireland? Well, uh, I think we should be all aware, and I know my uh, APS has just come back from America with some of his colleagues. They were out uh, on a young leadership course and they were looking at hydraulic fracturing uh, across the US. The US have managed 
uh, to bring down the price of energy in quite a dramatic way uh, because of shale gas. Uh, they are able now to bring manufacturing back from China and other places across the world. Uh, and I think we need to take note of that. There is no doubt about it. But I, I mean, I listened to um, the Environment Minister yesterday during his question time saying uh, that uh, the application uh, wouldn't happen uh, on his watch, I think was his um, uh, phrase that he used. Uh, but I think he needs to reflect on the fact that this is, uh, and I recognise it as such, uh, a novel and, con uh, and controversial issue. And therefore, this matter will be taken to the executive, and this will be a matter for the executive as a whole to decide on, uh, not just from my part, but from his part, and indeed uh, every other minister uh, in the Northern Ireland executive will have to take this matter uh, to the executive for a decision. And that's uh, something that I have known for some considerable time, but it's something that has been really underlined for me by the judgment of Mr Justice Tracy uh, last Friday, where he said that these issues need to be taken to the executive. And therefore, the decision in relation to hydraulic fracturing, no matter what each individual minister may feel about the process, needs to be taken by the Northern Ireland Executive. Call Mr Fergal McKinney. Principal Deputy Speaker and the Minister, uh, and the Minister has also touched on concerns which of course include environmental concerns. And, uh, can she tell the House what recent discussions she's had with the Irish Government about independent environmental protection agency engaging uh, scientific research into the potential environmental impacts of such exploration? Well, I very much look forward to uh, the piece of work that has been carried out uh, in the Republic of Ireland by their uh, EPA. Uh, I do uh, refer uh, the member and indeed the whole House uh, to a very important piece of scientific evidence that came forward uh, from the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, in the UK. I think everybody should read that. It re makes me reflect on the event that I attended very early this morning uh, in relation to pairing up scientists with uh, MLAs so that people were in full possession of scientific information. I think that's very important when we make decisions that we have all of the science in front of us. And this document is a very balanced document. It looks at shale gas extraction in the UK and does a whole review of hydraulic fracturing. And I think it's something uh, that members would maybe not enjoy reading, but I think they will benefit uh, from reading. And I do hope that members take the opportunity to have a look at it. I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, question number six, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Northern Ireland Executive Economic Strategy identified life and health sciences as a priority area. From 2009 to 2012, business sales have grown from 475 million to 680 million and employment from 4,250 to 5,580. Invest Northern Ireland has offered support of 44 million with the main focus on improving company R&D capability. In response to the Executive's Economy and Jobs Initiative, DETI and the Department of Health, Social Services and Personal Safety uh, established a group to assess the potential opportunities for employment and business development from the healthcare sector. The group recommended the development of a life and health sciences strategy, and this work is now being taken forward. Call Mr. Anderson for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Minister, you will of course be very aware of the, the cutting edge work being done in the life science sector uh, in my own constituency by ALMAC. Can I ask you what are your thoughts on the potential of the ALMAC Discovery's recent investment of £13 million in two recent, uh, recent uh, research and development projects? Well, can I say to the member that ALMAC continues to give us good news stories here in Northern Ireland and uh, I know they are very firmly rooted in his constituency and do a tremendous uh, job. They now employ 1,600 staff locally and pay over 49 million uh, annually in salary, so they're a very significant player, uh, not just in the Mid-Ulster area but right across uh, Northern Ireland. In total, Invest has offered £13.4 million of support to ALMAC in this last 
three years, uh, and most of that has been uh, in, in terms of research and development. And I think that's a, a very good, uh, and if I may use the pun, healthy sign for the company, because they are investing so much in research and development, they are looking to the future, they are investing it here in Northern Ireland, and uh, for me that shows a vote of confidence in the skills of our people here in Northern Ireland and the ability uh, to develop the products that they so heavily rely on. Thank you, and I call Mr. Alec Maskey. Colonel Wagon, people ask can I call a case over a shot. Question number seven, please. As noted in my previous responses to your party colleagues, uh, my department works with agencies in the Republic of Ireland where it is beneficial to the Northern Ireland economy. The economies in both jurisdictions face very different challenges. The Irish economy has almost double our unemployment rate, operates in the Eurozone and is subject to a severe fiscal regime imposed by the bailout from the European Union. I have therefore no plans to develop an All-Ireland strategy, but I remain committed to delivering actions detailed within our own Northern Ireland economic strategy and the more recent Economy and Jobs initiative. I believe that implementation of these activities will deliver growth, prosperity, jobs and rebalance the local economy in the longer term. Mr Alec Maskey for supplementary. Or Megan, previous and Corker. Thank the Minister for that response. But could the Minister advise the House if uh, you know, given that the, the, the a range of uh, across European wide initiatives for to tackle, for example, unemployment measures for young people, uh, and obviously there are different uh, arrangements, fiscal and other ways, in both these jurisdictions and this island, but can the Minister not see the sense, or does the Minister not understand that you know, it would be important to work with our colleagues uh, and, and our counterparts in the Irish Government to tackle issues on a cross-border and indeed on an all-island basis? Because obviously there are some differences, but there are also a, a lot of similarities, not least the fact that the young people across this island are finding it increasingly difficult to get jobs. Except that they're finding it increasingly difficult to get jobs. Uh, in fact, if you look at our unemployment statistics, they have over the past seven months uh, continued to fall. So it's not true that they're finding it increasingly uh, difficult to find jobs. But I do want to say to the member, and I said it in my question, I have no difficulty, and in fact, I will proactively work uh, with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland if it is to the benefit of Northern Ireland. I'm the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment for Northern Ireland. Uh, so, therefore, that has to always be uh, my primary uh, reason to do anything, uh, and that will continue to be the way I will do it. Uh, I, I will work with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, and of course I will work with colleagues uh, in the Westminster Government. And we were pleased to have uh, the, the Secretary of State for Business and Skills, Vince Cable, visit us uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, and we had some very good discussions in relation particularly to access to finance uh, for Northern Ireland companies companies because uh, that remains an issue, as I'm sure he appreciates for a lot of our companies, and we wanted to know, and I think I heard Minister uh, Simon Hamilton refer to this, we want to know how we can make those national schemes more applicable uh, to Northern Ireland, and we will do that through the work of the Joint Ministerial Task Force. I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask that the Minister, um, could you remind us what the current level of unemployment is in Northern Ireland? And how does this compare with unemployment levels in the Republic of Ireland? Well, that was one of the points I was trying to make, that uh, whilst, of course, there are still challenges uh, in our economy, uh, I don't take away from that. And in fact, uh, even when I was commenting on the huge success, which was the investment conference uh, last week, I did say that we still needed to have cognizance of those people who uh, struggled to find uh, a job. I don't accept it's an increasing struggle. I do think that there are still those who are uh, in difficulty. The unemployment rate uh, for Northern Ireland is currently 6.9%. Uh, and the Republic of Ireland's current rate of unemployment is 13.7%. Uh, so I think we need to uh, bear in mind uh, that we have difficulties here in Northern Ireland that we have to deal with. We will seek help from wherever we can get it, but we need to concentrate on the people of Northern Ireland because that's who we're elected to represent. Well, Mr Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for a response to it. Could I follow on through from, from the information the Minister has provided to the House? And asked her, would she acknowledge that within the North West area in my own constituency, where unemployment in the recent figures is 9%, that a much more targeted resource should be placed in that area to ensure that our young people have a better future? 
And I'm working uh, with the Minister for Employment and, and Learning on a strategy at present, which we hope to uh, bring very soon to the Assembly. It's something that we discussed at the last uh, economic subgroup on the, on the economy, uh, because we realise that despite the fact that our unemployment figures are of a level I accept what he says about his own constituency, but from a Northern Ireland perspective, or at 6.9%, uh, that there is a high level of economic inactivity that we really need to uh, grapple with. Uh, we uh, are high uh, above the rest of the United Kingdom, and we need to drill down as to why that is the case, and we've been doing a lot of work in relation to that issue, and as I say, uh, I think the Minister for Employment of Learning will be bringing that paper to the Executive in the very near future. I call Mr Jim Allister. Would the Minister agree that for the purpose of best serving the interests of the people of Northern Ireland, her focus needs to remain on keeping up with and being part of the signs of a beginning of a resurgence in the much larger United Kingdom economy, and that one of the tasks is to make sure that we do not fall behind that and do not get diverted into chasing the moonbeams that Mr Maskey referred to, but rather keep focused on building within that large world economy that is the United Kingdom. I entirely agree uh, with the member because, of course, when we have our Chancellor of the Exchequer in China talking about the United Kingdom economy, he's talking about Northern Ireland as well as talking about the rest of the UK. And it gives us the opportunity uh, then to go to China and to talk about issues from a UK perspective because there is such a global footprint in terms of the United Kingdom. I, of course, uh, uh, often when I uh, travel to foreign countries, use the good offices of uh, the British Ambassador and the British Consul General when I am out in these countries, and I use them to good effect because uh, since the Prime Minister came to office, he has decided very clearly that instead of a diplomatic role being the lead role for those offices, that really it should be an economic and trade role, and we welcome that because that means that they are more focused uh, when we visit the countries to help us to find new and inward investment for Northern Ireland. So yes, absolutely, one of the strongest reasons uh, for being in the United Kingdom is an economic reason, and I make no apologies for that. That's where we are better off. And I call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Principal Deputy Speaker's question 10 to the Minister. My department through Invest Northern Ireland is specifically focused on supporting the development of television and film production, digital media and music, as it is these subsectors of the creative industries which offer the greatest potential return for our economy in terms of employment and exports. Since 2007, over 450 new jobs have been created in the business operating in the television, film and digital sectors. In addition, Invest Northern Ireland supported uh, Northern Ireland's screen during this period, and that has helped to leverage over £96 million pounds of direct spend in the Northern Ireland economy on such things as wages and salaries, set production, hotel accommodation and transport costs. In short, securing a direct spend of over £4 for every £1 invested. Yes, I, th I thank the Minister for that answer and for effectively an ask answering my supplementary. Um, the, the return of 4 to 1 on investment by Northern Ireland screen, I'm sure she would agree, has to be commended. Uh, would she agree with me that there's almost unlimited potential in that area for further investment, which should be actively encouraged? For supplementary, um, can I say one of the most powerful uh, testimonies, if you like, uh, given at last Friday's investment conference was given by Jay Rowe from uh, HBO, and he uh, said uh, uh, that uh, Northern Ireland was the best place to shoot. I think he meant shoot a film in Northern Ireland, and uh, it was a, a very powerful uh, testament as to why people should look at Northern Ireland as a place uh, for the creative industries, uh, why they should look at it uh, for digital and actually production uh, jobs as well. And we are continuing to see companies come to Northern Ireland uh, and make television and film here in Northern Ireland, most notably, of course, Dracula from the Universal Studios at present, and then there are quite a few other television Productions going on as well. I call Mr. David McElveen for a supplement. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, the Minister will be aware, obviously, that the Game of Thrones um, programme has brought a, a lot of fame to Northern Ireland. I, I wonder, could the Minister identify are there any tourist opportunities that have come um, from the decision of Game of Thrones to shoot here? Well, absolutely, and uh, I, I hadn't realised 
how internationally um, thought of the Game of Thrones was until I was in Brazil uh, talking about tourism opportunities and then I mentioned the fact that uh, in June uh, that the tourist board along with Northern Ireland Screen uh, were bringing the Game of Thrones exhibition to Belfast and all of a sudden everybody lit up because they all were very much aware of the Game of Thrones on HBO. So uh, that exhibition took place uh, in June and we're also now developing a tourism trail um, uh, for the Game of Thrones so that people can actually see where uh, they're all filmed. Uh, and as well as Game of Thrones, of course, there are many other sets across Northern Ireland which can benefit uh, from tourism visits as well. And I'm thinking particularly, uh, as you would expect me to, of Blandings, which is filmed in County Fermanagh in Crum Castle. And already it has been referred to as Northern Ireland's High Clare, which of course is a set of Downton Abbey. So we're very pleased uh, that there are all of these tourism opportunities as well, of course, the business opportunities from the creative industries. Thank you, Minister. And that ends. Uh,